What was Alexius Menung's psychological theory? Menung divided mental experience into act, content, and object. He worked on the basis of Brentano's theory of intentionality, whereby all mental states intend objects. The mental act, or act element, is the way that the subject is directed toward the object. Whereas the specific content, or content element, is its focus in that case. For example, it is a different act to think of an apple versus to desire an apple. Thinking of an apple and thinking of a car is a difference in content. And going from one to the other is a change in focus. Menung's object theory bypassed traditional ontology because as intended objects. In the sense of Franz Brentano 1837-1917, it was not necessary that all objects exist. In fact, Menung stressed a bias toward existence in the history of metaphysics, which he called a prejudice in favor of the actual. Each object has a socian, or character, which is given through its nuclear features. Because objects truly possess their characters, even statements about non-existent objects can be true. Because how objects are is independent of their existence. For example, a pink unicorn is genuinely pink, even though unicorns do not exist. Who was Arthur Schopenhauer? Arthur Schopenhauer, 1788-1860, was influenced by the other German idealists, whom he despised as optimistic fools. Unlike Friedrich Hegel, 1770 to 1831, and both the right or the left Hegelians. His view of the idea that formed and worked the world was pessimistic. Who was Friedrich Hegel? For sheer intellectual firepower, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, was probably the most brilliant thinker of the 19th century. He was a philosopher who could think about the entire world with an Aristotelian comprehensiveness, if not an Aristotelian lucidity. What is existentialism? Existentialism is a kind of philosophy that begins from the concrete reality of the human individual's existence in the world. What is shared by all humans in their day-to-day -day life? becomes a foundation for knowledge and the nature of reality. Existentialism is focused on human experience from the first person, some me or I. Where does the human mind fit into Hegel's idealism? human geist, or mind, or spirit. 
is made up of the same categories that form reality, according to Friedrich Hegel. These categories, as ideas, develop in the individual life and in humanity as a whole over time. There are three stages of spirit, with the second higher than the first, and the third higher than the second. The first stage is subjective spirit, which is individual psychology. The second stage of Geist is objective spirit, or the traditions, rules and institutions of society. The third stage of Geist is absolute spirit, evident in the arts, religion and philosophy. As spirit understands itself, it becomes free and aware of itself, or self-conscious. Spirit preserves, destroys, and raises up what is not spirit. How are existentialism and phenomenology historically related? Existentialism and phenomenology both begin with the facts of human reality. From the standpoint of the first person. As distinctive traditions of thought, both have roots in the 19th century. Existentialism going back to Fyodor Dostoevsky, 1821-1881, Søren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855. And Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844 to 1900, and phenomenology originating with Franz Brentano, 1837 to 1917. Strictly speaking, existentialism is older than phenomenology. Although some 20th century existentialists have sought to base their work on that of more contemporary phenomenologists. Rather than their 19th century existentialist predecessors. Who was Max Weber? Max Weber, 1864 to 1920 held chairs at the universities at Freiburg, Heidelberg, and Munich. Although what biographers refer to as a nervous ailment curtailed his career as an academic. His main project was to understand the dominant features of modern life in its Western development. His most famous work was The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, 1904. What were Friedrich Hegel's main ideas? Hegel's system is difficult to describe because all of its parts are interrelated. And so to describe one aspect of it is to evoke all of the others, it is not clear exactly where an interpreter might begin. Hegel's order of exposition in the progression of his work is not a good guide because the structure of his system has to be presupposed in order to make sense of the progression. In other words, Hegel had his whole system in mind as he wrote about different parts of it. This said, there are several important elements that can be identified as Hegel's premises. Man has a history, but nature does not. All men do not have the same categories of fact. Human thought develops. Philosophy should give a rational account of religion. Social stability is possible after the French Revolution. 
individual autonomy is possible in a unified society. The nature of things is a system and a system of knowledge must reflect that. What was Peter Kropotkin's view of Darwinism in society? Kropotkin did not think that competition was a good survival strategy. Whether in the animal or human worlds. In his Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, 1902, he wrote the following. In the animal world we have seen that the vast majority of species live in societies, and that they find in association the best arms for the struggle for life. Understood, of course, in its wide Darwinian sense not as a struggle for the sheer means of existence. But as a struggle against all natural conditions unfavorable to the species. The animal species, in which individual struggle has been reduced to its narrowest limits. And the practice of mutual aid has attained the greatest development. Are invariably the most numerous, the most prosperous, and the most open to further progress. The mutual protection which is obtained in this case, the possibility of attaining old age and of accumulating experience. The higher intellectual development, and the further growth of sociable habits. Secure the maintenance of the species, its extension, and its further progressive evolution. The unsociable species, on the contrary, are doomed to decay. However, Kropotkin did hold that revolution is part of human evolution and that anarchism was a return to a condition that had been distorted by modern repressive institutions. Because human beings are naturally social, government is unnecessary. What is continental philosophy? Existentialism, Phenomenology, Critical Theory and structuralism all represent what is now called continental philosophy. Existentialism is a philosophical perspective on the world, which begins from the standpoint of one individual in ways that apply to all individuals. Phenomenology is a more abstract and systematic development of the processes of individual knowing and understanding. Existentialists have tended to be more literary than phenomenologists. Critical theory is a 20th century development of the theoretical methodology of Marxism. Structuralism is an application of a number of continental traditions to social criticism resulting in analyses of social structures. One thing they all have in common is that their original foundational ideas came from European thinkers. But more than geography is at stake with this name. Continental philosophy is often contrasted with Anglo-American analytic philosophy which has dominated in 20th century philosophy departments in American colleges and universities. Since philosophy became a profession in higher education during the 1930s, it should be noted that what is true of American academic philosophy departments has not been true of English, French, and German departments in the United States. 
which over the 20th century welcomed continental philosophy into their curricula. Moreover, continental philosophy is not alone in its stepchild status among American professional philosophers. Because the same thing happened to American philosophy, also known as pragmatism, after the 1950s. Was Alexius Meinung serious about non-existent objects? Yes, and it cost his reputation dearly, because Bertrand Russell 1872-1970, was to make great fun of him for it in his famous article on denoting, 1905. Still, other 20th century philosophers, such as Terence Parsons, 1939, and Roderick Chisholm, 1916-1999, were to defend the consistency of Meinung's. Ontology and the usefulness of being able to talk about non-existent objects. Meinung believed that non-existent objects include the merely possible, as well as the impossible. He thought that existence was just a property of objects, like smell, or shape. So that, for example, fictional characters lack that property, while Meinung himself had it. What happens after absolute knowledge is attained? Friedrich Hegel's science is aimed at uniting Immanuel Kant's 1724-1804, system of transcendental categories to Aristotle's, 384-322b. C. Logic about the real world. Hegel divides his thought process into treatments of being, essence, and concept, which are each divided into three parts, and so on. The contradictions in each category of nature require resolution leading to the categories that succeed it. According to Hegel, nature itself has developed in a logical way leading to ever greater abstractions in the form of our knowledge of nature. Hegel did not make clear distinctions between things in themselves in an ordinary realist sense, and our knowledge of those things. For Hegel, then, the progression toward more complexity in nature corresponds with the progression in human knowledge. What was Alexius Meinung's theory of value? Our emotions and desires have a cognitive ability to discern value. This does not mean that our emotions and desires can think but that. They tell us something about the world, often faster than our minds. Objects those things intended by us present themselves with value features. For instance, the smell of the apple directs me to eat it it has the value of being good to eat. Or a sunset presents itself as beautiful. A property that does not reduce to facts about the refraction of light or the amount of pollution in the air. There are also value universals, such as the good, the beautiful, the agreeable, the desirable, and different kinds of the obligatory, 
the general category of our duties. Mainung distinguished between dignitatives that are associated with ideas of the good and desideratives associated with ideas of duty. What were Sren Kierkegaard's stages of life's way? Kierkegaard claimed that faith required choices in self-development through three stages on life's way. Each stage is a different viewpoint on life. First, there is the aesthetic life, lived in the moment. Dedicated to the satisfaction of desire, and, in its refined form, to the appreciation of the arts. Lacking in this life is commitment. Commitment is found in the second stage in the ethical life, which seeks a unified self over time. The third stage is the religious life. What were the emotional conditions in Sren Kierkegaard's life? Kierkegaard's father, Michael, was a very gloomy man who had married a former maid as a second wife. He felt himself under a cloud of God's wrath and expected punishment through his children predeceasing him five of them did. The sins of Kierkegaard's father apparently consisted of his having impregnated his wife before they were married and in cursing God during severe weather as a ten-year-old shepherd. He later became well off as a wool merchant. Kierkegaard was sickly as a boy but he could reduce larger boys to tears with his sarcasm and mockery. At the University of Copenhagen, he did not find Hegelianism congenial because it did not address a truth. Which is true for me, to find the idea for which I can live and die. The religion of Lutheranism did not speak to him, either and for a while he indulged in expensive food and drink and wore fashionable clothes. Because he believed that immediate pleasure was the most important thing. But his father's despair haunted him and became his own. Kierkegaard was intending to become a pastor when he became engaged to Regine Olsen in 1841 he had met her when she was 14, three years earlier, and they were deeply in love. But Kierkegaard broke off the engagement, and she subsequently married her tutor. Frederick Schlegel, who became governor of the Danish West Indies. An original life's path was taking shape for Kierkegaard. And when he decided not to marry he also decided not to become a Lutheran pastor. Kierkegaard believed that philosophy was neither about system building nor analysis. But rather the expression of individual existence. He had no respect for professors because he did not think. There was any way they could comprehend his subjectivity. Kierkegaard's most important works were all written in the 1840s, either slash or, a fragment of life. 1843, Fear and Trembling, 1843, The Concept of Dread, 1844, Philosophical Fragments. 1844, Concluding Unscientific Postscript, 
1846, and the sickness unto death, 1849. His autobiographical writings and journals shed considerable light on his personal thoughts and feelings. Nonetheless, it was not his intention to disclose everything. He wrote, After my death no one will find among my papers a single explanation as to what really filled my life. That is my consolation, no one will find the words which explain everything and which often made what the world would call a trifle into an event of tremendous importance to me. And what I look upon as something insignificant when I take away the secret gloss which explains it all. When Kierkegaard was near death he refused a pastor's sacrament, remarking. Pastors are royal officials, royal officials have nothing to do with Christianity. His epitaph read, as he had requested, that individual. Who was Alexius Manum? Alexius Manum, 1853-1920, was born in Lemberg, Austria, and studied philosophy with Franz Brentano. 1837-1917, who set him the task of reading David Hume, 1711-1776. This resulted in two early books on Hume, the first on abstraction and the second on relation which appeared as Hume Study N in 1877 and 1882, respectively. Like Brentano, Meinung is considered an analytical phenomenologist. Unlike those phenomenologists. In the so-called continental tradition, he applied the rigors of logic to introspection. He established the Institute of Psychology in Graz, Austria, where he was a professor. Meinung is best known for his theory of objects and values. And his principal publication is on Assumptions, 1902. What did Friedrich Hegel think was the highest form of spirit? The modern state of Hegel's own time is considered by him to be the epitome of absolute spirit. This state is a unity that molds its members and also allows them individual freedom. Who was Marie-Louise Enkendorf? She was the pseudonym of Gertrude Kynel, George Simmel's wife. Under which she published her own philosophical writings. The Simmels maintained a salon for intellectuals but otherwise enjoyed a conservative. Bourgeois family life. They had one son. Who was Søren Kierkegaard? Søren Abib Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, was a Danish Christian existentialist who extolled religious faith as an individual and emotional leap from all that was reasonable and rational. He wrote from his heart and the emotional circumstances of his own life.
What was Friedrich Hegel's system? Knowledge, according to Hegel, begins with logic, the subject of which is pure being. Although logic is always mediated in history, so that we do not see or experience logic in its pure form, but have to infer it from relations among events. Past philosophy represents different forms of consciousness that have progressed toward absolute knowledge or philosophical science. The progression of consciousness occurs because different forms of consciousness are contradictory and their inner dialectic resolves the contradictions via the emergence of new forms. This dialectic is not a dialogue between consciousnesses, but the inner development of what consciousness is conscious of. Hegel is able to chronicle this development of consciousness toward absolute knowledge because it is presumed to be attained through his philosophical work. What was philosophically significant about 19th century psychology and social theory? In the 19th century, the foundations were laid for psychology and sociology to develop as distinct fields separate from philosophy. The reasons for their separation are differences in subject matter as well as methodology. Concerning the latter, Wilhelm Dilthe, 1833-1911, put the case of his age best in. Claiming that human sciences such as history, psychology, philology, and philosophy were characterized by a need to understand, whereas the physical sciences sought causes. However, in the 20th century, quantitative methodology and experiments in search of causes were to characterize important parts of both psychology and sociology. Quantification and causal explanation were also to characterize economics which did not become distinctly independent from political philosophy, sociology, and philosophy until the 20th century. But in the 19th century, the establishment of psychology and sociology as separate from epistemology, ethics, and political philosophy, as well as revolutionary critique, was a major achievement. What did Søren Kierkegaard deem his main vocation in life? Kierkegaard felt his main vocation was to reintroduce Christianity into Christendom. For him, Christianity was a way of existing. He thought that only humans existed, because they have internal reality. In contrast to God, who has external reality. Faith for him was an inward leap in answer to one burning question about God. What was Franz Brentano's main contribution to empirical psychology? Brentano's lasting importance lies in his emphasis on the intentionality of conscious states and attitudes. He pointed out that thoughts, 
beliefs, hopes, desires, and the like which Bertrand Russell. 1872-1970, was to term propositional attitudes are directed toward some object. For instance, if you are thinking about an apple then your intentional object is the apple you are thinking about. If you want a new car, it is the car you intend as an object of that desire. Because physical states are not intentional in this way. Intentionality is a basis on which what is mental can be distinguished from what is physical. Brentano identified three different kinds of intending. Ideas, judgments, and the phenomena of love and hate. The last, also known as emotions and volitions, are directly related to morality. Although an earlier version of Brentano's doctrine called imminent intentionality suggested that the object intended was in some way literally in the mind. He later explained that although there is always a mental object for consciousness the object need not literally exist. The point is that one can think of a thing that does not exist. Objects of thought that do exist have strict relations with other objects that exist, whereas those that do not exist lack them. What is the story behind Friedrich Schelling's Scandalous? Romantic affair with August Wilhelm von Schlegel's wife? When he was teaching in Jena, Schelling was close friends with German poet August Wilhelm von Schlegel, who was highly esteemed by other German romantics, and with Caroline, who would later be the poet's wife. There was discussion of marriage between Schelling and the Schlegel's daughter, Augusta. But Augusta died from dysentery in 1800, after Schelling had supervised her treatment. At first, Schelling was blamed. But later biographers exonerated him because her death was probably medically inevitable at that time. Schelling and Caroline then recognized their love for each other. And August moved out, leaving Jenna for Berlin. Later, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, another famous literary figure, helped secure a divorce. And Schelling and Caroline married, after they had left Jenna to avoid the predictable scandal. Is Hegel's system purely abstract? Very abstract thinking is necessary to understand Hegel's system. But the system itself is presented by him as a literal account of reality. Categories are at the outset literally embedded in physical nature, which expresses them. Space expresses a lower category of being. Whereas living organisms embody and express the higher categories of concept, purpose, and life. Thus, the development of the system of thought is evident in the development of the real world. Except that thought, or the absolute, is the ultimately real actualizing and defining principle of everything that exists. Who was Sigmund Freud?
Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, was the founder of psychoanalytic theory and clinical practice. He developed the idea that early childhood experience has a lifelong influence in shaping personality and character. The importance of childhood education was emphasized as early as Plato. C428 C348 BCE, but Freud was the first to stress childhood emotional experience. Freud was also responsible for the popular acceptance of the idea that self-understanding does not occur immediately and automatically, but requires a special kind of reflection. The ancient Greeks are famous for the maxim, know thyself. But Freud's distinct contribution was that there are different layers of the self to be known. Freud's principal works are The Interpretation of Dreams, 1900. Three Essays on the Theory of Sexuality, 1905, and Civilization and Its Discontents, 1930. Also of particular interest in his application of his theories to Healthy People in Ordinary Life is Psychopathology of Everyday Life, 1901. Who were the right and left Hegelians? Active interest in Friedrich Hegel's ideas died out soon after his death in 1843. But his influence has nonetheless continued in much 20th century thought. His ideas were immediately interpreted by the right Hegelians, who believed that the Prussian state represented the final union of philosophy and Christianity, and the left Hegelians, including Ludwig Andreas von Fugerbach, 1804-1872, and Karl Marx, 1818-1883. Who interpreted a politically revolutionary future for the dialectic propounded by Hegel? How did Max Weber connect Protestantism to capitalism? Weber observed that capitalism required investment, which itself required an excess of money over what was needed for existence. He believed that such saving was a form of asceticism encouraged in Protestant churches that valorized work and devalued enjoyment of the results of work. Weber noted that other religions dominated in societies that were not capitalistic. Weber called the mental process that made capitalism possible rationalization. And he analyzed its presence in efficient, rule-based Western government, as well as economics. He thought that liberal political systems could be an advantage to nations Germany in particular in their international struggles. But he also believed that the accompanying scientific worldview, which downplayed custom, led to a disenchantment of the world. Weber thought that a possible course of correction to the rationalization of bureaucracies was mass democracy, which would result in charismatic leaders. What was Franz Brentano's psychological theory of right and wrong?
Brentano thought that judgments can be correct or incorrect and that the same held for loving and hating. If a thing is good, then it is impossible to love it incorrectly. Correctness in loving and hating is objective, as is incorrectness. Brentano was an intuitionist concerning such correctness. He thought that we could be immediately and directly aware of the fit between the emotion and the object. 1859-1938, the founder of phenomenology, and Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, the father of psychoanalysis. He was ordained as a Roman Catholic priest in 1864, but renounced his vows after engaging in a dispute about papal infallibility. He resigned his professorship at the University of Vienna, so that he could marry, and was not able to regain that position. Later years left him blind. But he continued to write in virtually every subfield of philosophy until he died. Brentano's principal writings are psychology from an empirical point of view. 1874, and our knowledge of the origin of right and wrong, 1889. What are some details of Sigmund Freud's life that led him to his work? Freud was born in Freiburg, Germany, but raised in Vienna, Austria. He studied medicine at the University of Vienna, specializing in neurology. In 1886, Freud married Martha Bernays. They had six children, and the youngest, Anna, herself became a noted psychoanalyst. Freud's youngest son, Ernst, was the father of Lucien Freud, the celebrated 20th century portrait painter. Biographers of Freud assess his family life as happy and stable. Providing much needed support for the controversy that swirled around his startling and original psychological theories. Freud's mentors J. M. Charcot and Joseph Brewer investigated hysteria, and Freud became interested in the psychological aspects of this disorder because hysterical patients have physical symptoms without underlying disease. Freud and Charcot published their clinical findings of how talk can change patients' ideas. As a treatment for hysteria, in their studies in hysteria, 1895. As Freud developed a sexual interpretation of the causes of hysteria, Brewer distanced himself from him. What was Sren Kierkegaard's burning question? For Kierkegaard, the most important question was whether there was a God, and thereby an afterlife. He did not think that question could be answered by any marshalling of the appropriate facts or through an intellectual process of any kind. It was a rational question, but there was no answer to it. The only acceptable answer was an actual leap of faith within and by the individual. Furthermore, insofar as the facts of the world rendered the possibility of God and an afterlife absurd. This absurdity itself is a test of faith. The more absurd something seems to be, 
the greater the faith necessary to believe it. Kierkegaard thought that great faith was the key to being a Christian. To this end, he deployed the biblical story of Abraham and Isaac. God commands Abraham to take Isaac up a mountain and then sacrifice him. This act is pathological in ordinary terms, but in religious terms. For Kierkegaard, it is the quintessential example of a leap of faith. What are some highlights of Friedrich Hegel's career? Hegel was the eldest of three children. His father was a minor government official in the Duchy of Wittenberg. His mother died when he was eleven. He attended the theological seminary or Stift, which was a subsidiary of the University of Tübingen. His roommates were the great German Romantic poet Johann Christian Friedrich Holderlin and the philosopher Friedrich Schelling. 1775-1854, who would be his colleague and intellectual opponent. They disputed the importance of reason. With Hegel proudly affirming it and Schelling expressing a lack of enthusiasm for it. When he graduated, Hegel first worked as a tutor for a Bern family, and then he moved to Frankfurt. His father's death provided him with sufficient income to concentrate on his own scholarly work in hopes of getting a university position. His early interests were in reconciling fluid notions of reason with non-institutionalized Christianity. In 1805, Schelling assisted Hegel in moving to Jena where he lectured for several years and became a professor at the University of Jena. By this time, as expressed in his early essays, Hegel was having doubts about the freedom promised by the Enlightenment. He loved the thought and ways of life of ancient Greece and believed that Enlightenment rights would result in new forms of repression. One motivation for this concern might have been his experience of the French Revolution. On a deeper philosophical level, he thought that what was most noble in human beings required society and government for its development. This view conflicted with the individual rights doctrine, which assumed that government was the enemy of natural human rights. At Jena, he co-edited the Critical Journal of Philosophy with Schelling, which was dedicated to exploring the consequences of Immanuel Kant's 1724-1804 Transcendental Idealism. In light of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, 1762-1814, and Schelling's own work, Hegel left Jena when the university closed after Napoleon Bonaparte's victory in October. 1806 He then edited a pro-Napoleon newspaper in Bavaria and became headmaster of a Nuremberg high school in 1808. In 1807 Hegel's important Phenomenology of Spirit was published. And then his Science of Logic, 1812, resulted in a professorship at Heidelberg. In 1818 he assumed his last post, which was as a professor at Berlin. Lecturing widely on philosophy of history, history of philosophy, aesthetics, and philosophy of religion. 
much of which was unpublished until it was posthumously compiled from his notes and those of students. Hegel's Foundations of the Philosophy of Right Natural Right and Political Science in Outline was published in 1821. How are psychology and philosophy related? Up until the 19th century, no clear distinction was made between philosophy of mind and psychology. The science of psychology did not yet exist in its own right until the early 20th century. Early historical figures in the science of psychology, such as Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, are of interest to philosophers because their theories of the human mind changed ideas about human nature in ways that philosophers had to take into account. Why did Søren Kierkegaard believe Friedrich Hegel did not write to him? First of all, Kierkegaard did not take seriously Friedrich Hegel's 1770-1831, claim to have written the system of everything. Kierkegaard thought that everything could be viewed as a system by God. But that no human thinker, who is himself incomplete, could have such a perspective. He also rejected the tradition on which Hegel built that. Posits intellectual doubt as the beginning of philosophy. Kierkegaard thought that the beginning of philosophy was wonder. Also, he didn't think that real doubt could be solved intellectually, but that it required an act of will. Finally, Kierkegaard did not think that God or the Absolute could be imminent in the world. Because God is instead the ultimate other, defying rational understanding. Kierkegaard's biggest complaint about Hegel was that he was like a man who had built a palace but lived outside it in a miserable hovel. He meant by this that in constructing his grand and elaborate system, Hegel had neglected his own immediate existence as a concrete individual. Was Kierkegaard cursed? Kierkegaard had a self-fulfilling way of being cursed. There was not only the matter of Rajin Olsen after he broke off his engagement. He spent the rest of his life tormented by her loss. There was also the Corsair affair of 1845 to 1846, when, after an unfavorable review, he wrote the following in dialectical result of a literary police action, with a paper like the Corsair, which hitherto has been read by many and all kinds of people and essentially has enjoyed the recognition of being ignored, despised, and never answered. The only thing to be done in writing in order to express the literary, moral order of things reflected in the inversion that this paper with meager competence and extreme effort has sought to bring about was for someone immortalized and praised in this paper to make application to be abused by the same paper. May 
I ask to be abused the personal injury of being immortalized by the Corsair is just too much. And abused he was, in a campaign so bitingly satiric and mocking of all his personal weaknesses and defects he was short and frail. And had been born with a hump on his back that he described. Himself as apprehensive of everyone with whom he came into contact, even the butcher boy. This was not self-indulgent paranoia because Kierkegaard experienced the modern phenomenon of a celebrity degraded by the gutter press everywhere he walked in Copenhagen. It was a catastrophe for him because walking and talking to people in all stations of life had been his principal diversion. Was Kierkegaard cursed? Kierkegaard had a self-fulfilling way of being cursed. There was not only the matter of Rajin Olsen after he broke off his engagement. He spent the rest of his life tormented by her loss. There was also the Corsair affair of 1845 to 1846, when, after an unfavorable review, he wrote the following in dialectical result of a literary police action, with a paper like the Corsair, which hitherto has been read by many and all kinds of people and essentially has enjoyed the recognition of being ignored despised, and never answered. The only thing to be done in writing in order to express the literary, moral order of things reflected in the inversion that this paper with meager competence and extreme effort has sought to bring about was for someone immortalized and praised in this paper to make application to be abused by the same paper. May. I ask to be abused the personal injury of being immortalized by the Corsair is just too much. And abused he was, in a campaign so bitingly satiric and mocking of all his personal weaknesses and defects he was short and frail. And had been born with a hump on his back that he described. Himself as apprehensive of everyone with whom he came into contact, even the butcher boy. This was not self-indulgent paranoia because Kierkegaard experienced the modern phenomenon of a celebrity degraded by the gutter press everywhere he walked in Copenhagen. It was a catastrophe for him because walking and talking to people in all stations of life had been his principal diversion. Was there only one kind of religious life for Sran Kierkegaard? No, Kierkegaard distinguished between two. In the first, the individual relates to God, using his idea of God to deal with guilt. In the second, there is a teleological suspension of the ethical, as in the story of Abraham and Isaac. The implication of this transcendence of the ethical is that real religion is higher and more important than what is accepted as goodness in society. Was there only one kind of religious life for Sran Kierkegaard? No, K. 
Kierkegaard distinguished between two. In the first, the individual relates to God, using his idea of God to deal with guilt. In the second, there is a teleological suspension of the ethical, as in the story of Abraham and Isaac. The implication of this transcendence of the ethical is that real religion is higher and more important than what is accepted as goodness in society. Why have existentialist philosophers claimed Dostoevsky as one of their own? The great Russian novelist Fyodor Mihailovich Dostoevsky, 1821-1881 is considered an inspiration to the modern philosophical tradition of existentialism because of the depth of his appreciation for the difficulty of the human condition and the universal problems he and his fictional characters agonized over. Friedrich Nietzsche 1844-1900 said that Dostoevsky was the only psychologist from whom I have something to learn. He praised Dostoevsky's notes from the underground, 1864, for having cried truth from the blood. Indeed, in notes from the underground Dostoevsky introduces a self-deprecating narrator who became an iconic anti-hero for subsequent existentialist writers. The narrator's first words are, I am a sick man, and his ensuing reflections, rantings, and ruminations make it clear that the sickness at issue is primarily a malaise of the soul. Not the least of the sickness is a disgust with reason. Although Dostoevsky is well known for valorizing simplicity in religious faith, he did not arrive at that viewpoint easily, either in works of fiction such as Crime and Punishment, 1866, or in his own life. In his masterpiece, The Brothers Karamazov, 1881, Ivan is an atheist. While his brother, Elisha, is studying to become a monk. In the famous Grand Inquisitor dialogue within this novel, Ivan presses Elisha on his faith. Going to the heart of the matter in asking how a good God can permit the suffering of innocent children. Ivan recounts the story of a peasant's child whom the Lord allows his dogs to tear apart. Because the child threw a stone at one of them. The character of Elisha is said to be modeled on Dostoevsky's close friend. The Russian philosopher Vladimir Sergevich Solovyov, 1853-1900. Who longed to reunite the Roman Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches. Why have existentialist philosophers claimed Dostoevsky as one of their own? The great Russian novelist Fyodor Mihailovich Dostoevsky, 1821-1881 is considered an inspiration to the modern philosophical tradition of existentialism because of the depth of his appreciation for the difficulty of the human condition and the universal problems he and his fictional characters agonized over. Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900 said that Dostoevsky was the only psychologist from whom I have something to learn. 
he praised Dostoevsky's notes from the underground, 1864, for having cried truth from the blood. Indeed, in Notes from the Underground Dostoevsky introduces a self-deprecating narrator who became an iconic anti-hero for subsequent existentialist writers. The narrator's first words are, I am a sick man, and his ensuing reflections, rantings, and ruminations make it clear that the sickness at issue is primarily a malaise of the soul. Not the least of the sickness is a disgust with reason. Although Dostoevsky is well known for valorizing simplicity in religious faith, he did not arrive at that viewpoint easily, either in works of fiction such as Crime and Punishment, 1866, or in his own life. In his masterpiece, The Brothers Karamazov, 1881, Ivan is an atheist. While his brother, Elisha, is studying to become a monk. In the famous Grand Inquisitor dialogue within this novel, Ivan presses Elisha on his faith. Going to the heart of the matter in asking how a good God can permit the suffering of innocent children. Ivan recounts the story of a peasant's child whom the Lord allows his dogs to tear apart. Because the child threw a stone at one of them. The character of Elisha is said to be modeled on Dostoevsky's close friend. The Russian philosopher Vladimir Sergeyevich Solovyov, 1853-1900. Who longed to reunite the Roman Catholic and Russian Orthodox churches? What aspects of Dostoevsky's life influenced his deep interest in human difficulty? Dostoevsky's father was a violent and abusive alcoholic. He was also the doctor of the Mariinsky Hospital for the Poor in Moscow. Dostoevsky himself suffered from epilepsy from the age of nine. As a child, he used to disobey his parents and explore Mariinsky Hospital. Absorbed by the misery of the patients and the stories about their lives that they told him. His first book, Poor Folk, 1846, brought out the individual humanity of the poor. Who were otherwise be ignored and dismissed by the educated reading public of the time. In 1849, Dostoevsky was arrested for his participation in the liberal group of intellectuals called the Petrashevsky Circle. He was sentenced to death. Although Tsar Nicholas II did not really intend for the execution to be carried out. Nevertheless, the experience of standing for hours in the freezing cold in anticipation of a firing squad was believed to have scared Dostoevsky for life. He was then exiled to Siberia for four years of hard labor. He wrote of this period, in summer, in tolerable closeness, in winter. Unendurable cold. All the floors were rotten. Filth on the floors an inch thick. One could slip and fall. We were packed like herrings in a barrel. Fleas, lice, and black beetles by the bushel. When Dostoevsky's brother and wife died in the same year, he fell into a deep depression and became a gambler. During that period he wrote Crime and Punishment, 
1866, in a frenzied haste, because he was out of money. His life evened out after 1867, when he married his 20-year-old stenographer to whom he had dictated The Gambler, 1867. While this book is about an elderly woman who gambles self-destructively. Some think that Dostoevsky was describing his own compulsion. Dostoevsky lived at the Russian resort Storea for years before his death. From emphysema and an epileptic seizure that brought on a lung hemorrhage. 40,000 people went to his funeral. What aspects of Dostoevsky's life influenced his deep interest in human difficulty? Dostoevsky's father was a violent and abusive alcoholic. He was also the doctor of the Mariinsky Hospital for the Poor in Moscow. Dostoevsky himself suffered from epilepsy from the age of nine. As a child, he used to disobey his parents and explore Mariinsky Hospital. Absorbed by the misery of the patients and the stories about their lives that they told him. His first book, Poor Folk, 1846, brought out the individual humanity of the poor who were otherwise be ignored and dismissed by the educated reading public of the time. In 1849 Dostoevsky was arrested for his participation in the liberal group of intellectuals called the Petrashevsky Circle. He was sentenced to death. Although Tsar Nicholas II did not really intend for the execution to be carried out, Nevertheless, the experience of standing for hours in the freezing cold in anticipation of a firing squad was believed to have scared Dostoevsky for life. He was then exiled to Siberia for four years of hard labor. He wrote of this period, in summer, in tolerable closeness, in winter. Unendurable cold. All the floors were rotten. Filth on the floors an inch thick. One could slip and fall. We were packed like herrings in a barrel. Fleas, lice, and black beetles by the bushel. When Dostoevsky's brother and wife died in the same year, he fell into a deep depression and became a gambler. During that period he wrote Crime and Punishment, 1866, in a frenzied haste, because he was out of money. His life evened out after 1867, when he married his 20-year-old stenographer to whom he had dictated The Gambler, 1867. While this book is about an elderly woman who gambles self-destructively. Some think that Dostoevsky was describing his own compulsion. Dostoevsky lived at the Russian resort Storea for years before his death. From emphysema and an epileptic seizure that brought on a lung hemorrhage. 40,000 people went to his funeral. Who was Friedrich Nietzsche? Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900, to 1900, 
was a brilliant philosophical iconoclast who's devastatingly direct. Critical writing style might in itself have qualified him as an existentialist. More substantively, though, was how he developed critiques of bourgeois culture, Christianity, empirical reason, an altruistic morality from the standpoint of a protesting individual who was grander, smarter, more creative, and in odd ways for a much later readership, hipper than those who championed accepted values of the time. While Dostoevsky and others had criticized modernity in the hope of a return to more conservative religious values, Nietzsche looked ahead to coming generations who would use science as an art to transcend the dreariness of Western history. Who was Friedrich Nietzsche? Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844-1900, was a brilliant philosophical iconoclast who's devastatingly direct. Critical writing style might in itself have qualified him as an existentialist. More substantively, though, was how he developed critiques of bourgeois culture, Christianity, empirical reason an altruistic morality from the standpoint of a protesting individual who was grander, smarter, more creative, and in odd ways for a much later readership, hipper than those who championed accepted values of the time. While Dostoevsky and others had criticized modernity in the hope of a return to more conservative religious values, Nietzsche looked ahead to coming generations who would use science as an art to transcend the dreariness of Western history. How did Friedrich Nietzsche's life presage his philosophy? The great irony is that in life Nietzsche was very unlike his heroes. Either those of the aristocratic past that he so admired, or of the new age of knowledge and courage that he heralded. His life began in a somewhat sheltered way in Prussia. His father, a Lutheran minister and the son of a Lutheran minister, died when he was four of what the doctors called softening of the brain. His mother, Franziska, was only 18 when Friedrich was born, she was the daughter of a Lutheran minister. Contrary to Nietzsche's belief that his forebears were Polish noblemen, many of them were butchers. When Nietzsche was six, his younger brother died, and he, his mother, and his sister moved to Naumburg. Nietzsche grew up in a household consisting of his mother and sister. His paternal grandmother, and two unmarried aunts. Biographers have remarked that this al-family environment was detrimental to his psychological health as an adult. They have referred to this environment in trying to make sense of the hostility. Nietzsche displayed toward women in some of his writings. Such as this from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, 1883-1885 When thou goest to woman, take thy whip. At boarding school, Nietzsche suffered from migraines. He was inspired by the poetry of Johann Holderlin, who had gone insane. So this was not considered a healthy subject by Nietzsche's teachers. 
Nietzsche studied theology and classical philology at the University of Bonn. But only philology at the University of Leipzig. He served briefly in the army from 1867 to 1868, and was discharged after a chest injury. Which was incurred when he landed on the pommel of his saddle while mounting. When he was only 24, his teachers considered him so promising that he was appointed associate professor of classical philology at Basel. Nietzsche moved to Basel, became a Swiss subject, and, in 1869, a full professor. In 1870, he received leave to serve as a medical orderly in the Franco Prussian War. Returning to Basel with both dysentery and diphtheria. He received his doctorate in 1873 and resigned from his academic position in 1879 for health reasons. After that, he continued to write and to travel for nine years. How did Friedrich Nietzsche's life presage his philosophy? The great irony is that in life Nietzsche was very unlike his heroes. Either those of the aristocratic past that he so admired, or of the new age of knowledge and courage that he heralded. His life began in a somewhat sheltered way in Prussia. His father, a Lutheran minister and the son of a Lutheran minister, died when he was four of what the doctors called softening of the brain. His mother, Franziska, was only 18 when Friedrich was born, she was the daughter of a Lutheran minister. Contrary to Nietzsche's belief that his forebears were Polish noblemen, many of them were butchers. When Nietzsche was six, his younger brother died, and he, his mother, and his sister moved to Naumburg. Nietzsche grew up in a household consisting of his mother and sister. His paternal grandmother, and two unmarried aunts. Biographers have remarked that this al-family environment was detrimental to his psychological health as an adult. They have referred to this environment in trying to make sense of the hostility. Nietzsche displayed toward women in some of his writings. Such as this from Thus Spoke Zarathustra, 1883 to 1885 when thou goest to woman, take thy whip. At boarding school, Nietzsche suffered from migraines. He was inspired by the poetry of Johann Holderlin, who had gone insane. So this was not considered a healthy subject by Nietzsche's teachers. Nietzsche studied theology and classical philology at the University of Bonn. But only philology at the University of Leipzig. He served briefly in the army from 1867 to 1868, and was discharged after a chest injury. Which was incurred when he landed on the pommel of his saddle while mounting. When he was only 24, his teachers considered him so promising that he was appointed associate professor of classical philology at Basel. Nietzsche moved to Basel, became a Swiss subject, and, in 1869, a full professor. In 1870 he received leave to serve as a medical orderly in the Franco-Prussian War. Returning to Basel with both dysentery and diphtheria. 
he received his doctorate in 1873 and resigned from his academic position in 1879 for health reasons. After that, he continued to write and to travel for nine years. What are some of Friedrich Nietzsche's important works? Nietzsche's principal works consist of ten books, which are universally held to be a major achievement. His most famous works include The Birth of Tragedy, 1872, The Gay Science, 1882. Thus spoke Zarathustra, released in four parts from 1883 to 1885, Beyond Good and Evil. 1886, on the genealogy of morals, 1887, and the Antichrist, 1888. Not to be forgotten is Eki Homo, or Behold the Man, 1888, which he dedicated to Voltaire and in which Nietzsche included his own endearing essay about his own works, why I Write Such Good Books, 1888 What are some of Friedrich Nietzsche's important works? Nietzsche's principal works consist of ten books, which are universally held to be a major achievement. His most famous works include The Birth of Tragedy, 1872, The Gay Science, 1882. Thus spoke Zarathustra, released in four parts from 1883 to 1885, Beyond Good and Evil. 1886, on the genealogy of morals, 1887, and the Antichrist, 1888. Not to be forgotten is Eki Homo, or Behold the Man, 1888, which he dedicated to Voltaire and in which Nietzsche included his own endearing essay about his own works, why I write such good books, 1888. What was the nature of Nietzsche's disability? Much controversy swirls around this question. There is evidence that he was treated for syphilis at Leipzig, while being kept ignorant of the diagnosis. He is believed to have had tertiary syphilis when he died. It is not clear when Nietzsche might have caught this disease, since he lived an ascetic life. But it was perhaps the result of visiting a brothel only once or twice while he was a student. Nietzsche's health was poor throughout his life. His eyesight was weak and he had gastrointestinal pains that he treated himself by walking and by taking a plethora of pills. In January 1889, Nietzsche broke down in a street in Turin, his arms around a horse that had been beaten. Over the next few days, he wrote demented letters to his friends. Claiming to have been crucified by German doctors in a very drawn-out manner. And ordering the Emperor of Germany to report to Rome so that he could be shot. His friends brought him back from Italy, and his mother put him in a clinic in Jena. 
The treatment was unsuccessful, though, and his mother brought him home. In 1893, his sister, Elizabeth, returned from Paraguay, where her husband had committed suicide. She took charge of the editing and publication of Nietzsche's manuscripts and isolated him from his friends. When their mother died in 1897, Elizabeth brought Nietzsche to Weimar, where she allowed people to see him. Nietzsche was not communicative, but she had him dressed up anyway. So that she could display him. He was by then very famous. What was the nature of Nietzsche's disability? Much controversy swirls around this question. There is evidence that he was treated for syphilis at Leipzig, while being kept ignorant of the diagnosis. He is believed to have had tertiary syphilis when he died. It is not clear when Nietzsche might have caught this disease, since he lived an ascetic life. But it was perhaps the result of visiting a brothel only once or twice while he was a student. Nietzsche's health was poor throughout his life. His eyesight was weak and he had gastrointestinal pains that he treated himself by walking and by taking a plethora of pills. In January 1889, Nietzsche broke down in a street in Turin, his arms around a horse that had been beaten. Over the next few days, he wrote demented letters to his friends. Claiming to have been crucified by German doctors in a very drawn-out manner and ordering the Emperor of Germany to report to Rome so that he could be shot. His friends brought him back from Italy, and his mother put him in a clinic in Jena. The treatment was unsuccessful, though, and his mother brought him home. In 1893, his sister, Elizabeth, returned from Paraguay, where her husband had committed suicide. She took charge of the editing and publication of Nietzsche's manuscripts and isolated him from his friends. When their mother died in 1897, Elizabeth brought Nietzsche to Weimar, where she allowed people to see him. Nietzsche was not communicative, but she had him dressed up anyway. So that she could display him. He was by then very famous.